Hey there, in this video I'm going to show you how we can generate random values from something other than a uniform distribution. So your uniform distribution says it's just as likely to generate a random number between 0 and 1 half as it is from 1 half to 1. And by default your computer will give you values 0 to 1 and then you can do things like stretch that interval by multiplying by a number, adding, subtracting values, but you're really limited to uniformly distributed random numbers. There is a way to use a uniform random number to create a non-uniform random number, and that exploits the idea of probability density. So for some background here, the total probability of an event, so this is something like 0.3, means that there's um, 3 out of 10 chance of something happening. 0.1 would be 1 out of 10 chance of something happening. And that probability can be described by integrating from some lower limit to some upper limit a probability density d of x dx. The uniform probability density is equal to 1. But a non-uniform probability density could represent like maybe it's easier to generate small values than large values. These probability densities, these lowercase p's, are normalized. So what that means is if we integrate the probability density over all possible values, generically negative infinity to positive infinity, then we have to get 1. So that means there'll be some kind of constant built into little p that guarantees that the integration here over the whole range gives you a probability of 1. So in other words, over all possibilities, there's a 100% chance that the thing happens. So again, our simplest probability density is going to be the uniform probability density. I'll use a z here for the uniform probabilities. That's what your random number generator gives you. So to calculate the probability of an event using this simple probability density, where you have your lower limit at 0 and your upper limit at some z, then your probability of that event is just z. In other words, let's say we make a graph of this. So I'm graphing probability density with respect to whatever its argument is. So in this case, zero, z, so zero to z, and we have a probability density of one. So which colors here? The area here of this curve is going to be just the probability. which would just be z. Okay, so that's our uniform version. And all this is kind of overkill if you're just doing uniform probability. But let's look now at a non-uniform probability density. So let's remake that graph, where instead of having a constant one, we have some function p of x, ranging from some x min, which might not be zero, but could be zero, up to some value x. And we have now a different shape. So let's say it looks something like this. Okay, our area in there, that's still the probability. And that probability <clears throat> has not changed. Or we can, we can skew things so that the probability has not changed. So that is still p equals z. But it's also p equals the integration of everything underneath. So it's also equal to the integral from x min to x, d of x dx. But it's distributed differently. And so we can now make a mapping from one to the other. So in the case here with the blue curve, it's more likely that events here are kind of towards x min, and it's not too likely that they tend towards x. So if I generate random numbers from the red region, most of them are going to end up mapping to regions like over here, over there. And then maybe just this last little bit would map to this last little bit here in x. So what we can do with this is we can generate random values from the red region, and then those random values can mathematically be mapped into the blue region to give us a non-uniform spacing. And so at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is solved to find out what is x 
as a function of z. And then you can generate a uniform z using one of your random number functions, plug it into the math that you will have to work out by hand to calculate what equivalent random number x you would get from the non-uniform distribution. Where you're solving the integration x min to x p of x dz equal to z. Okay, so that's that's the name of the game here. And again, you have to do that integration by hand. This is only practical if the integration is analytic, so that you can then invert your math here to get x as a function of z. Let's look at an example. We're going to do radioactive decay. So in radioactive decay, the probability density of having a radioactive decay in time t is equal to natural log 2 divided by a constant called the half-life times 2 to the power e on tau. Okay, so tau is the half-life. And that natural log 2, if you're wondering, is the result of normalizing this probability density. So that if you went over the entire range of values, in this case the total range of values that even makes sense is from zero to time infinity, guaranteed you'll have everything decay. So now let's try and write some math that will let us generate a random number z in the uniform range zero to one and then map that into a value t that will tell us when some random atom is going to have its decay, at least in a, a random number sort of sense. So we're going to do here range from, we had x min to x, here t's make more sense, so t min is zero, you can't have time less than zero, that wouldn't make sense here, up to time t. Then we have the probability density, so that would be natural log 2 on tau times 2 to the power negative t on tau dt, and that has to be equal to z. So I want to solve the integral on the left hand side so that I get some algebra that I can rearrange to be in the form t equals some function of z. Now in doing this integration, we've got a natural log in here, or a not, not natural log. We have a uh, exponential, but it's not base e, it's base 2. And so we are going to use properties of natural logs to turn this into a base e integration. And this is sort of a math thing, but just in case you are not familiar or haven't seen this in a while. So 2 to the negative t on tau is the equivalent of a base e exponential to some power x. And we're going to basically here solve for x so that we can make this transformation. If I take the natural log of both sides, the natural log of 2 to the negative t on tau is equal to the natural log of e to the x, which is x. Using the power uh, properties of logarithms, natural log of something to a power is equivalent to taking that power out front, multiplying the entire logarithm. And so there we go. This tells me that I can replace x here in e to the x with negative t on tau multiplying natural log 2. So my integration can be rewritten. And I'm just doing this so that I can solve the integration analytically. So I'm going to have integration 0 to t natural log 2 on tau e to the negative t on tau natural log 2 dt is equal to z. Now carrying out the integration, I'm going to get the constant natural log 2 on tau. We move that 2 down here. And then I'm going to have e to the negative e on tau natural log 2. And then divide all of that by the argument of the exponential. So let's divide everything by a natural log 2 on tau. Yeah, actually that's going to cancel out the constant out front, which is kind of a lucky thing for us. It's all equal z. And I need to evaluate this 0 to t. Okay, so plugging in those limits, 
and accounting for this minus sign down here, I'm just going to flip things around for us. I'm going to end up with 1 minus e, the negative t on tau natural log 2 is equal to z. That's just me plugging in the limits. And so we can rearrange this e to the negative t on tau natural log 2 is equal to 1 minus z. Take the natural log of both sides. Negative t on tau natural log 2 is equal to natural log 1 minus z. Therefore, t is equal to negative tau divided by natural log 2. And multiply that by natural log 1 minus z. So that's the function that we can use. And we're going to follow this up with some code where we use it. The idea is I generate some random number z, 0 to 1, and I plug that number into this equation here to get a new skewed number t that will be biased in the way with the or biased in a way that corresponds to this original non-uniform probability density. In other words, it's going to prefer short times around the half-life, and it's not very likely that an atom is going to survive for a hundred half-lives it's pretty likely that it's going to survive for, oh, or, you know, around one half-life, or even a little bit less than one half-life. Half-life means that half your sample is gone. Uh, so your average atom is going to disappear in less than a half-life. Okay, so here I am back in the notebook. And let's revisit this idea of changing the range that we're generating our random number from, or the distribution we're generating it from. So. If we start with a uniform distribution for a random number, we create some value z using NumPy to get a bunch of them, make a thousand. And then if we looked at like what values do we get, we could use hist for this. Having the default 10 bins is not really enough. Let's do 20 bins. And let's look at what we get. So we got our values randomly generated doesn't mean that there's exactly as many in every bin because it is random but in general this is a pretty flat well it's an exactly flat distribution and the more values we put in here the flatter it will look just the that's just the statistics of it but we'll just start with a thousand so now what I want to do is change those into coming out of the distribution corresponding to a half-life So let's use uh, carbon dating for our example here. So carbon dating is based on the decay of mildly radioactive carbon-14 into stable nitrogen-14. And so by measuring the ratios of carbon in fossils, you can then determine how old they are based on how many half-lives have passed. So the half-life for carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And then we can calculate t using the equation that I worked out by hand. If you remember, t was equal to negative half-life divided by the natural log of 2. In Python, log is the natural log. Log 10 would be the base 10 log. Then we want to multiply that by the natural log of 1 minus z. And then let's just check out what this distribution looks like. So we're going to plot the histogram of t. We will again use 20 bins. We can see that this distribution is skewed towards smaller values. So half of your sample is supposed to disappear in the first 5,730 years, but some will be left. And then in the next 5,730 years, half of what's left disappears, and then half of what's left, and then half of what's left, and so on. So this distribution is decidedly not uniform. It's skewed towards smaller values. So now we can plot the carbon and the nitrogen as a function of time. What we've created here in the array t is an array of random values of when each carbon atom has its decay. So you can imagine we have a thousand carbon atoms and they each have names one two three four up to a thousand or I guess up to well yeah say up to a thousand 
and each one has some day when it will decay. And all of those times are now stored in the array t. So I want to sort the array t to sort when effectively each carbon is disappearing. So let's call that new sorted array decay times. We'll call np.sort, which sorts arrays for us, and we'll sort array time t. So now decay times will be ordered from smaller values to larger values. The issue here is that t was not in any particular order. Uh, just to reinforce that, we could print t, or let's just print the first 10 things in t. You can see that these numbers are not in any particular order. They're just by atom. So now the sorted version will be sorted from smaller to larger, listing when each one disappears. And we should have more small values in this array than large values. We know that because of the histogram. So coming back here, now that we have an array of times that each thing decays at, we can now look at the count of carbon and nitrogen. So the amount of carbon here is just going to count down from 1,000. So we can build that array pretty quickly with an A range. We'll start it at, uh, well, it started at 1,000. And then at the first time in the T array, we're down to 999. And we keep dropping all the way down to 0. I'm going to write a negative 1 here because, remember, we stop 1 before the end of the A range. So this would stop us at 0 carbon. Can't have less than 0. And we want to make our steps negative so that we're stepping down. So this will, this will look like 99, 98, 97, so on, all the way down to 0. And then the amount of nitrogen is simply going to be 1,000 minus the amount of carbon. So this 1,000 here is based on me having, way back at the beginning, 1,000 points or 1,000 carbon atoms. If I had 10,000, I'd want to change these to 10,000. So that's the end of the calculation. It, all the hard work was in calculating T. Now let's look at the output. So we're going to make some plots. We'll plot. A times versus carbon and let's make that a solid line we can even give it a label carbon plot decay times versus nitrogen we'll make that a dashed line and we'll give it the label nitrogen we'll add a legend just to make it look nice For our x label, we'll do time in units of years. This is because my half-life was in units of years. And then the y label will just be the number of the carbons and nitrogens as a function of time. And let's show it. So here's our graph. The carbon decreases exponentially. Meanwhile, the nitrogen rising for every carbon lost, we get a new nitrogen. We can see that this graph is wiggly. This is not a theoretical curve, although for the problem we did here, you can calculate theoretically how many carbon there is as a function of time. We did something different. We simulated how much carbon there was as a function of time. And so sometimes you're a little bit above the curve. You can see like when there's a little peak here, sometimes you're a little bit below because it's random. You know, you could randomly have the carbon get stuck for a while. It's not very likely, and we didn't happen to see it in this case, but if we ran this code over and over and over and over again, eventually you would see something that looked a little unusual just based on the statistics of when the carbon does or doesn't decay. We could do a quick check here. Uh, let's make a horizontal line at the half-life. As I can see here, these two curves cross, and it sort of looks to, eye, to my eye that that's where the half-life is. Nice thing about having this in the computer is that's a real quick thing for us to do. So we can just plot an, XV an x v line at tau. I think by default it would probably be blue. Uh, so we're going to make it black. Just so it's a lot easier to see. Let's throw that down. And it looks like it's really close to where they cross, but not exactly. Again, that's the randomness. You know, So sometimes it'll be right there. Sometimes it'll be off by a little bit. And the last thing here, it might bother you that we started at 999 instead of 1,000. It's a small change, but what we can do is we can append, or I guess prepend, onto our decay times array a zero, and we could prepend onto our carbon a thousand, to represent that very first data point that at time zero we had a thousand. Uh, but this is an array of when things decayed, so when we see the first decay time, we've already lost one. That's why I started at 999.
for a thousand points like this, it doesn't really matter. You never even see whether or not there was an extra data point here out of the 999 or a thousand that are already here. Okay, so in this video, we ran through how to use probability densities to generate non-uniform random numbers. And then we went through an example with carbon dating. 